welcome to Question Time. Tonight we are in Inverness. On tonight's panel, Angus Robertson, former SNP campaign coordinator for the 2014 referendum on independence. Currently, Constitution, External Affairs and Culture Secretary for the Scottish Government. Craig Hoy, Chairman of the Scottish Conservative Party and a member of the Scottish Parliament since 2021. Pam Duncan Glancy, also elected to Holyrood last year, now Scottish Labour's spokesperson on social justice and social security. Journalist, commentator, Daily Telegraph columnist and editor of the right of centre political magazine The Spectator, Fraser Nelson, and award-winning comedian and contributor to TV shows such as Frankie Boyle's New World Order and Have I Got News For You, Susie McCabe. Welcome to my panel, welcome to the audience here in Inverness, good to see you and of course welcome to you at home. Do join in the conversation the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time and we'll see what you've got to say about tonight's topics. And to that end, let's hear our first question which is from Ian Columbine. Will there be another independence referendum in 2023? Well, Angus, no surprise, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, so, yes, I hope there will be a referendum in October next year. And the reason why I think there should be is because we had an election where this was the main issue last year in Scotland. And we had a record majority return to the Scottish Parliament uh, elected on a manifesto that there should be a referendum. Can, now I we just, can, can I just ask you just one something, Angus? And, sorry, Nicole, and then I will absolutely let you carry on. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon was asked in reference to the 2021 uh, election, how someone who wanted to be who wanted her to be first minister but did not want a referendum during the COVID recovery, how she should vote. And Nicola Sturgeon said they should vote for me on Thursday, safe in the knowledge that getting through this COVID is Precisely. my priority. In, in, so in, how does that make it a mandate for independence? It, indeed, because the manifesto said we need to get through COVID and then we will have a referendum within the first half of the Scottish parliamentary term. I think given developments this week, I think it's important to focus on the heart of the matter, which is not about whether we are yes voters or no voters or we're undecided voters. It's about whether we live in a country where we are able to exercise our democratic rights and decide on issues, regardless of where we are, on the question. We had an election last year. The issue was decided. The majority of MSPs elected to the Scottish Parliament were elected to give us all the choice about the country's future. And it behoves politicians in London and their supporters here in Scotland who disagree with independence to acknowledge that in a democracy, it's the people who should decide. And it's not for our democracy to be blocked by Boris Johnson or anybody else. We voted to have a say. We should have a say. You all should have a say about the country's future. The, so, so the first thing I'd say is that Angus must have been knocking different doors last year than I was Maybe. because there's absolutely no um, assurance that, that people were talking only about a referendum. And the fact that the SNP are trying to make us into a single issue country is really, really disappointing. And I think, Ian, the question of whether or not we should have an independence referendum next year, I, I, I don't think so. And Angus said a moment ago um, to focus on the heart of the matter and then he went on to talk about the referendum. I want the government focused on waiting lists. One in eight people are sitting on waiting lists in the NHS. Child poverty is rising. It's at 26% across Scotland. In some parts of Glasgow, where the First Minister is, is um, the representative, it's up at 36%. So we've got rising child poverty, waiting lists going through the roof, and I think the government actually really needs to be focusing on that. They had a lot of mandates when they were elected, and those all, all of those mandates deserve the attention that this government seems to be giving the attention to the independence referendum. Fraser. Well, to answer the question, I don't think there'll be a referendum for, for three reasons. First of all, was the legality of it. I mean, this, Nicola Sturgeon's asked for Supreme Court, but the weight of legal opinion seems to be against her. Secondly, you've got whether um, the SNP would win that or not. I mean, for the last, most of the last opinion will suggest not. They're quite close. But it's, you get quite a lot of nationalists, actually, who don't want this referendum. They think it'd be crazy to have it unless at least we're ahead in the opinion polls. If you lose twice, as they found out in Quebec, then that's pretty bad for an independence movement. But the biggest reason I think there won't be one is because Scots simply don't want one. We've had opinion polls, uh, we've had another two this morning, showing the majority of people don't want there to be a referendum in the timetable that Nicholas Sturgeon's talking about. Um, I mean, partly because you've got the SNP voters who aren't sure it's a good idea. 
but also you've got a country that's exhausted. The democratic Absolutely. voice of Scotland was given not so long ago um, in a referendum in 2014, and that was the vote to stay in the union. And there is also a d the democratic rights, the people who don't want to be put through this mill again and again and again, especially when public opinion hasn't really changed much from 2014. The polls show Scotland is pretty much still where it was all those years ago. So why take a vote in a country which doesn't want it? Now, Angus has got his um, activists here to keep happy, so this is, which is what I think is happening here. They want to think that there's a great battle just around the corner. But really, I think Boris Johnson might be tempted to call it bluff, because if there was one and they'd fight it, in the apparent opinion polls would be a real struggle, especially when you start to ask who, who pays the pensions, in what currency, how would you cope with a hard border with England, but it'd have to be after Brexit. Difficult questions, and I don't think the SNP in its heart of hearts really wants to answer them. So I'm not that worried about a 2023 referendum. I'm going to go around the audience. I'll give you a chance to answer some of those points, Angus. I'll just go around the audience. Uh, the man there in the black top. Yes. Oh, yes, there. Thank you. Um, we don't run a country based on opinion polls. And uh, the SNP... <laughs> the SNP uh, ran an election along with the Greens and all the other unionist parties, well, not <laughs> the unionist parties, I should say, based on an electoral system set up by the British government under the Scotland Act. Under that act the proportional system returned a majority for an independence referendum. That is a fact. And it is our right under the first article, first article of the United Nations to choose how we determine the future of this country. Whether that's every second minute or every thousand years is irrelevant. It's not about being put through the mill. And people who are maybe finding that they're being put through the mill by being asked questions that are relatively simple, maybe should disengage from the process overall, because this is normal around the world. Mm. Okay. The woman there in the blue scarf. Yes, you in the blue scarf there. Yeah, um, I'm afraid, much as some politicians might like it to be the case, democracy in Scotland did not stop in 2014. So much has changed since then. In 2014, I was a yes voter and my English husband voted no. 2023, I'm a yes voter again, and guess what my husband's going to be voting? And you can trace that directly back to, amongst other things, the Brexit vote, everything that's happened. The <laughs> The way the, the UK government seems to be lurching inexorably towards the, the right and very little of that is, is what the Scottish people voted for or are happy about. So I, I think bring it on. Okay. Thanks, Fiona. The, uh, you asked the question, should there be a referendum in 2023? Well, the question is, will, will there be? Will there be? Will there be? Uh, in my opinion, there probably will be. I hope there's not. Uh, I'll tell you why there shouldn't be one, though. One, no means no. We've already uh, debated that already. Uh, but secondly, I think we all agree that we want the best thing for Scotland in this room. OK? Do we really want a society which is split down the middle? Because currently, we're talking about roughly 50-50. Now, the SAP gentleman will say it's 52, it's 48, it's 48, 52, depending on what it's going to be. We're talking about fine margins here. Now, I have to admit, if the, the, the vote for independence was 74 independence and 30 against, I would go with the, the majority. I don't think that's a, a good thing for Scotland because it's going to divide Scotland right down the middle and it's never going to get better until we have that, that uh, conclusive debate there. OK. And, and the man there in the... In the uh, no, the, the man in the blue top in, with the glasses, yes. Hi. Um, whether we have a referendum or not, surely now isn't the time. Absolutely. Financially, as a country, we are in real trouble. You're going to spend countless millions on a referendum that may happen, it may not. Surely it should be ploughed into where it's needed now, not in some pipe dream that's possibly in 16 months. OK. Craig. I hope there isn't uh, another independence uh, referendum uh, next year. And I think the people uh, that email me and that I speak to in the street and the pub hope there isn't going to be another independence referendum next year because that's not their number one priority right now. Throughout this audience, right throughout the country, people are struggling with the cost of living crisis. They're struggling with public services that haven't come back after the COVID pandemic. Only this week, 
we, fund, we found out that uh, Scotland's cancer waiting times are the worst on record. The child and adolescent mental health service waiting lists are through the roof. People are waiting more than two years for routine operations. Uh, the pupil attainment gap in Scotland is now uh, at its worst for five years. So there are huge issues, huge issues for us to contend with. The cost of living crisis, helping families through that, making sure that we get our public services back up and running again. Those are the people's priorities. And I say to Angus, why doesn't he for once, for once just take independence off the table focus on the people's priority and govern in the Scottish national interest and not in the interests of the Scottish National Party. And, Craig, as far as the Conservatives are concerned, would there ever be a right time well, look, for, the, for there a, to be a referendum? I'm a Scottish Conservative and Unionist. Uh, it should come as no surprise that I don't want an independence referendum now, next year or into the future. So, so what, you what is the do, democratic so way that there so ever you, could be one? So you wouldn't, well, you wouldn't expect me to spell out to the SNP how they might hold an independence referendum, but don't forget, at this point in time, 60% of Scots don't want. Six in ten Scots, including uh, uh, many, many uh, SNP supporters, are saying this is not the time, Angus. So why doesn't they, they focus on the day job and, and move on with that? But you can't expect me to spell out how, where, why and when there should be a referendum. No, I'm just in asking much, in principle, in much, in, would, that, would, that, would that mandate ever be accepted? Well, it, well in principle, there, there, there may be a point in time where, where we get to that, but you wouldn't expect me to flesh that out. Much in the same way you wouldn't expect Angus to flesh out the case for strengthening the union. Susie. Uh, I don't know if there'll be a referendum. Right, I tell jokes for a living. I am not a lawyer. Uh, my personal opinion is I hope there's a referendum and just, just a few points that have been brought up there. So we're talking about the vote to stay in the union. In 2014 I was told, oh if you vote no, you'll still be in you, you you'll still be in the, the EU. If you vote yes, you'll be out the EU. That's a massive issue for Scotland. Yeah. We're a, a small country. <laughs> We're a small country with a falling population. We need that migration in this area alone for tourism. You need that. If we go across a little bit to places like Ullapool, they need that EU membership for our fresh produce that Murdo so kindly listed the other day on GB News, all the fresh produce that we export to the EU. Uh, with regards to the currency, Mervyn King on STV tonight, Mervyn King, a man who ran the Bank of England for 10 years, actually said it was entirely feasible for Scotland to keep the pound and have a shared currency. Mervyn King, that his job was to run the Bank of England. And he's like, yeah, no, it's entirely feasible. We're talking about society split down the middle. If we're not going to do things because they're divisive, that, that's an absolutely ridiculous argument. We live in a country shaped by social class, right? Social class is divisive. Our education systems is divisive. Yes, there's inequality. Yes, there's poverty. I believe, personally, my vote towards independence, it's not going to be an easy road. It's going to be a difficult road. But I'm willing to take a chance on it. Now, I don't have kids, but my mates have kids, and I've got, fam I've got kids in my family. And that vote maybe just isn't for me. That vote is for further down the line. It's not that long since we had a referendum vote. We've just come through a two-year pandemic. There's an awful thing, a lot of things wrong in our society. The cancer waiting lists, you know, 25% of people not getting treated for first-time treatment for cancer within that 62-day period. Okay. That's awful. We should be spending the money on the people who really, really need every it. Every waking hour. Yep. I'm not saying there should never be a vote or a referendum on um, independence, but the t I don't think the time's now. Oops. And when do you think the time might be out of independence? I think you're quite right. I think it's our children's choice. I think it's probably in a generation or two's time. Could I just, and, just come in? There. Because like, I, I understand what you're saying with regards to the NHS. I actually heard a former colonel of the armed forces on the radio today who said that this country now has to make a choice between defence spending and healthcare spending. So, as an independent nation, are we going to choose to spend that money on defence or are we going to spend it on the NHS? Because ultimately, when that power rests at Westminster, a 100% that money will be spent on bombs and bullets. Okay. Pam, you so want to come I, I actually...
and I, I, I mean, the way that money is being spent by both the Tory and the SNP government just now is an absolute disgrace. The waste of money, the disregard for people's uh, the cost of living, the fact that people people cannot put food on the table. Four hundred thousand people in Scotland have missed energy payments because they can't afford to pay for them. So all of these things are huge, huge issues. And you make the point, Susie, about inequality and it's about our children's future. It absolutely is, and social class is a really key issue. But do you not think that people in England and across the rest of the UK also face these social class issues? My ambition for a better Scotland is not narrow for a better Scotland, but my ambition is for a better United Kingdom, for a better Europe, for a better world. And we should never narrow our ambitions for anything like that. Let me a bit more from the audience. The man there with the glasses in the middle. Uh, hi there. I feel that we should have it now because all we're going to do for the next, say, five, six, seven years is say, when's the referendum? When's the referendum? I think there was changes in with the European referendum and obviously being promised to stay in Europe. I feel we need to do it now and if we lose, accept it and then try and prevent the Tory it, government yeah. in Westminster and focus on socialist left-wing yeah. values in Scotland. OK. The man, the man there with the beard. Yeah, I've heard at least three different versions of people saying that the people don't want a referendum. And I would suggest politely that the people that are saying that should look at the last most recent election where 49% of the electorate wanted a referendum. Look at the last general election where the Labour Party <coughs> had their worst results since 1910 and one MP represents Scotland. So they're they're either not listening to the people because people aren't voting for you. Tories aren't listening to the people because people aren't voting for you either. No. Right? You haven't been it's in power in Scotland since 1955. Right? Mm. Maybe if you all listened to the people, then you would understand what we're saying. You guys are custodians of our country. You work for us. Yeah, mm. could I? Right? Okay, hang on. Let me just come back to Angus. Yes, what you hear, you're, hearing, you're certainly hearing support for a, a second referendum. You're also hear, hearing people say from the panel, but also from the audience, never mind a referendum, you need to be concentrating on getting things and improving things right now that we're worried about, like the cost of living, like NHS waiting lists, like all sorts of things are impacting life today. Sure. So what normally happens is when political parties win an election and they form a government, the opposition then calls on the government to do what it was elected to do. And the government in Scotland and a majority of MSPs elected to Holyrood were elected so that there should be a referendum and the public should be able to choose. But they were also and elected, elected for other reasons me. as well. Forgive no, hang on, Angus, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They were also, hang on, let me, me, let me interject. The they were also no, elected for other parties, reasons as well. Indeed, but for losing political parties to lecture the election winning parties and suggest that the people should not have their say has got more well, to do with the fact Angus, that they oppose independence but Angus, rather don't. than the fact that they're prepared to uphold democratic standards. What I'm trying to say this evening is but Angus, we have Angus. rather, forgive me, let me finish my point. I think at the heart of this question is whether we as Democrats are going to trust the people Angus. to make their choice and I trust the people. We're not governed by opinion polls. Um, we are not going to be driven by the views of the parties Thanks. that lost an election. We are going to deliver for the people. The people voted to have a choice. The people should have a choice. And all of the arguments around um, uh, the difficulties that exist post-COVID and with the austerity situation that we have handed down from Westminster, that's not an argument to not have a choice. That's an argument to have a choice. Let's Angus, bring it on. Angus, let's Angus, have a Angus, referendum Angus, and let's settle the issue. Angus, 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 you talk. But Angus, Angus. You, you talk about the sovereignty of the Scottish people, but why does the sovereignty of the Scottish people in 2014 mean absolutely nothing to you? No, it means, it, it, of course, in 2014, people take, took a view on independence at that stage. But democracy is not a single moment in time. It's not a single people election, have the right. right people have the Focus right the to choose Andrew. and change their mind. People have the right to reflect on the fact that they were lied to in the Brexit referendum. We were told, vote, vote no to independence and we will stay in the European Union. The public was lied to. We've been taken out of Europe against our will. 62% of people in Scotland voted to remain. Maine. There's been a material change okay. in circumstances. People have voted to have a say in a Scottish referendum, and that's exactly what they should get. Either we live in a democracry or okay. we don't. Angus, we, we hear Fraser. Much more you can Fra hang on, let me bring Fraser. I'm just remembering another thing the politicians said in the 2014 campaign. Nicola Sturgeon was saying that this referendum would be a once in a generation event. 
Now, that makes sense, because otherwise, where do you stop? Now, a few days ago, the Scottish Parliament was due to debate drugs deaths in Scotland. I mean, Scotland's got a drug death rate three times higher, not just than any other part of the UK, but any other country in Europe. That's a really important thing. That debate was delayed so they could talk about independence instead. Now, that is the issue. It sucks the oxygen. A devolved government is supposed that to be looking clear. at the priorities. And you guys will end up in this never-ending. That's the problem. I There's know. never going to Not be a time. You'll never, you'll never take no for an answer. It was, if there had been a massive <laughs> shift in, in public opinion, then yeah, fair also, enough. But there's been no evidence of anybody really significantly changing their minds in Scotland. And why do you put all of this precious political attention on things that the SNP's constitutional fantasies rather than the real huge problems which you were elected to solve? Let me, let, Susie, let me just, can, just, just want to hear a little bit more from the audience and I'll come back to you. Yes, the person right at the back with their hand up. Yes, you. Yeah. Uh, in 2014, one of the big, like, you know, shouts from the No campaign was that, um, you know, vote no if you want to remain in the European Union. And then two years later, we were dragged out against their will with a 62% remain vote. Surely that's a massive change of the goalposts and it's a reason for another referendum. A third of SNP voters voted no, voted for Brexit. That's the thing, on both sides of it. I mean, 40%, no, sorry, no, it was little less, two in five Scots pretty much voted for Brexit. So it goes on both sides. You get the double outers who don't see why you should then um, take back control from Brussels only to go back in, and, and Westminster only to go back to Brussels. So that's why the overall equation hasn't changed very much, because it's not true to say every SNP voter wants Brexit. A third of them, a, a third of them did want Brexit, two thirds didn't. OK. It's a young person there in the glasses, yeah. I'm only 17 years old. I couldn't vote in the first Scottish referendum. I couldn't vote in the Brexit referendum. Mm. I was only able to vote for the first time last year. Now, so much has changed since then. Two out of the three exams I've sat, I didn't sit because they were cancelled. So much of a society has changed since, you know, since 2014. And the generation of young people that have lived through the pandemic, that have gone through all these things that no other generation has, should be able to make the decision about our future and our country. Where Can I make a point? Oh, okay. 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 Um, I'll come to you and then Susie, I'll come back to you. Thank you. And the, the woman who's just spoken is absolutely on the button. The way that education is yeah. being dismally failed in Scotland is a disaster. And the exams that you sat in the last couple of years would have been very, very different had the SNP government properly handled education well, over the pandemic. And that, but, but Angus, I, I, need to, I, need to, I need to also pick up, so you, you made that you said that it was this lies and what about, what about the First Minister who told us in the, in the election just passed and in the election last May that actually she would be laser focused on the COVID recovery. We have absolutely not come out of the pandemic yet because it's the, the thing I find absolutely staggering is that any time I ask the question of the Scottish Government in the Chamber about the NHS waiting list, and believe me, they are in some mess, um, on behalf of my constituents, the Cabinet Secretary turns around and says, oh, but we're still in a pandemic, it's still going to take a wee, bit, um, a wee bit time to get us out of that. Either we are or we're not. You can't have it both ways. So we need a government that is absolutely focused on education, focused on health, so that people in Scotland can absolutely move forward from this pandemic. We are not out of the woods yet. And in fact, the clinical director this morning, you, were, you quoted some, someone from the NHS earlier, Susan, the, the clinical director this morning said that he is concerned about rising cases and numbers. So we have a serious situation that still requires the attention um, of the government. And while the government is distracted by an independence referendum, I seriously worry about the future of our NHS and our education system. But also, I think, I think Fiona, part, part, part of the reason they want to talk about independence is because they don't want to talk about their abysmal record on schools, hospitals, roads and railways. This is a diversionary yeah. tactic. Can I... Uh, Ferries as well. There's a few things here. So, first of all, Fraser brought up drug deaths. Scotland needs to have a grown-up conversation with itself about drug deaths in this country, right? Every death caused by drugs is tragedy. Now, we've got... Uh, we've, we've, there's a, a twin issue here. There's two types we've got. Our heroin and our opioid deaths, which are deprivation, urban areas, densely populated areas. We know all the reasons. And we have treated them the same way we have always treated them, and it doesn't work. So Scotland needs to go and look at things like safe consumption rooms in those areas, right? And more rural areas, we need to look at needle dispensaries. That's also going to be supervised, stopping the spread of HIV, hepatitis, safe, clean areas to do that. On the other side of that coin, is cocaine deaths. The numbers are rising in the over 40s males. Now, 
But Susie, in terms of getting this back to, to, to the need for a referendum or not... This is what we didn't discuss in the Scottish Parliament. Yeah, yeah. Because there's no point. This because they're distracted. It, right? And at some point, Scotland needs to have another conversation with itself about decriminalisation. And Scotland cannot do that because that's got to come from Westminster. And no one in Westminster is going to look at... All the, but, but all the points you've just made, all the points you've just made about, about prevention overdose um, centres, those are the sorts of things that we could introduce yeah, right we, now here in Scotland. And uh, Paul Sweeney, yep. a colleague of mine in Parliament, has already yep. been putting um, proposals on a bill for that. All so we can do that now. Scotland has to have these conversations. Yeah. Well, and we absolutely. need to look forward yeah. we to we decriminalisation. Do. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Are you going to tell me the Conservative Party believe in decriminalisation of drugs? <laughs> What I am going to say is that we're bringing forward... <laughs> Do you, no, right? No, 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 we don't. But what I am saying is that we are going to bring forward, and Douglas Ross is going to bring forward, a right to recovery bill so that everybody uh, gets access to uh, rehab who needs it in Scotland today, because presently they're not, and that is a drug. Okay. Well, and I'm another thing on that Susie, subject... Susie, really briefly, because otherwise the audience... Okay. And look at all those hands. They're not going to get a word in. Another thing on that subject is you need to take out the criminality, you need to treat it like mental health, take it off the NHS, put it into the public sector and get it fixed. OK, the man there in the glass with his hand up in the blue shirt. Hi. Uh, we're just coming out of a pandemic. We've got a cost of living crisis. Education's yeah. going down the toilet. The NHS has <laughs> got waiting lists as long as your arm, and perhaps a little bit longer. But who? Who cares? What's a referendum? What yeah, nonsense? Yeah. So why... Angus, do you think that's a legitimate question? I heard you say Tory activist. Well, I'm then. delighted. I, I, we know one another well from my time being the Member of Parliament for Murray, where the, the questioner was a leading Conservative Party uh, activist. So we take a different view on defeated. all of this. The point that I'm trying to, to make, and repeatedly so this evening, is that we will be on different sides of the argument about whether Scotland should be independent or not. But regardless of our political affiliation, regardless of whether we're yes or no voters, do we trust the people to decide? And for Fraser and others just to blithely talk as if the issue has not been debated at length and the people have voted on this in, a, in an election in Scotland, Craig, where you lost in East Lothian against the SNP, and I, I would have hoped that you would have learnt the lesson standing yeah, against exactly a referendum right. was not the popular right. choice in East Lothian. People in East Lothian and in most constituencies in Scotland returned SNP members is that the Parliament has been elected with a record majority, the biggest ever... I don't know why you're shaking your head, Fraser. It is the biggest ever majority in the Scottish Parliament in favour of a referendum, because and that that system. should take, take place in the first half of this Parliament. Of course we can debate about all of these other issues that are really important, but the idea that you park democracy, that you break democracy, that you take people's choice away from them, that is not acceptable so when, in a when, country where democracy but, should be at the heart of our national life. I, just, okay. I, need, I need to just say that... To, to, to sit there and say that that is about breaking democracy. Breaking democracy is suggesting that we get to a general election next year and we're on a single issue thing. Literally, Let given the people. The pe so, so, you're gonna, the people so you're honestly going to go do. to the polls next year. You're honestly going to go to the polls next year if you have to, or, or whenever the next general election is, if you have to only having independence on the ballot paper when people care about so, so much more than that and you think it's everybody else that's got a problem with democracy. Sorry, I couldn't hear. You don't have to vote for them. It's up to the people. Yeah, if the people the choose to the vote, parties? they vote. What about all the other parties, like the Green Party, for example? What happens to them in Angus Robertson? They choose. But, but that is surely choose. damaging like democracy. democracy. That is damaging democracy. But the democracy. people have got their own choice. They exactly. can either go Stop with this single people. option, SNP, or not. All right, let's hear from the woman there. Straining to put your hand up in the purple. Thank top, you, then. thank you. And nice to see Angus again. I think the panel is great with all their answers. But let's get this straight. It's a matter of timing. And <coughs> what we've heard, particularly from Pam, I believe it is, um, which you, you've done sterling work there. And we should be listening to you because I'm certainly for less able and more vulnerable people in our society, no matter where they live, Scotland or the United Kingdom. And at the end of the day, we've got a lot to put right first. So I think it's timing, Angus. Scotland, if they, I, if they, I will vote against, but if they get uh, independence, I will be one of the first to make sure that we make that successful. Good. And that's what democracy is all about. Quite right. Right. Quite right. Quite right. Quite right. The members of the panel and others sit and point their fingers at the SNP, accusing them of being a one-issue party, and you say they're never going to take no for an answer. But we keep electing them. You need to wake up and smell the coffee. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. 
Let me take let me take one more point from the man there in the in the black shirt. No, no, the, we've heard from the man in the black shirt. I think, um, no, behind then. Fraser mentioned uh, in his first comments about the fact that nothing much has changed in the last eight years. Public opinion. I think everybody in the audience can see from the comments I've made a huge amount has changed in the last eight years. Yeah. One of the biggest factors that's changed in the last year is the advent of Boris Johnson and this completely incompetent Westminster <laughs> government. Absolutely. And I, very briefly, so I want to move on. So, so, so much has changed. And the notion that the Tories are the great defenders of the union um, is laughable, I have to say. And the only way to get Boris Johnson out of Downing Street is to vote Labour at the next general election. OK. What a surprise he oh, came yeah, out yeah. of that, Father. There we go. OK, look, I just, I'm going to move on. But before I do, I just want to tell you where we will be next week. So next week, the programme is coming from Barnsley and the week after that from Torquay. So that's July the 14th. So if you'd like to come and be in the audience in either Barnsley or to Torquay, go to the Question Time website, you can follow the instructions there and come and be part of the programme. We'd love to see you. All right, let's take our next question now. It's from Derek. Derek Shirley, where are you? Right, off you go. Hi. With the continued rise in COVID-19 positive cases in Scotland, is it time to reintroduce some restrictions such as mandatory face masks? What do you think, Derek? Um, personally, uh, maybe um, these restrictions are all for the greater good, um, whether I like them or not. OK, because COVID cases certainly are rising across the UK. Scotland, as it happens, has the highest rate of any nation, according to the latest ONS survey. Um, Craig. Um, I recognise that we're going to have to learn to live with COVID, and, and I share your concerns about the, the rise in cases. It's the same across the country, at least slowly, and where I am too. But I think if we look back to... There was two forms of harm last time around. There was the harm done by COVID, and then there was a very real harm that was done to people's lives, to their livelihoods, to shops, to businesses, to pubs, uh, and to the hospitality sector. So my view would be that for as long as humanly possible, and hopefully forever, that we learn to live with COVID as we live with other um, viruses, we learn to live with the flu. But that means that we've got to make sure we stay on top of the vaccination program and that means raising public awareness about the vaccination program rolling it out the vaccine program was one of the great successes uh, of uh, the the uk during the pandemic and we shouldn't uh, 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 avoid looking at the simple fact that here in scotland we took longer to open up afterwards i think we extended the harm done by those restrictions so i for one wouldn't want to go back to them and i hope that people will uh, regularly test and make sure obviously that they uh, don't go near people that are vulnerable uh, and, and so on and so forth but face masks and restrictions and starting to uh, close uh, venues and things, I just hope, I, I hope and hope and hope that we never go back there. So, Pam, in, in Scotland here, I think it's happened today, two hospitals have suspended all but essential visits, two wards have been shut to admissions. Do we want to go back? I mean, we don't want to go back, but do you think there is a case we're going back I, I, I to think, face masks and, I, I and other think the reality, I think the reality is, Fiona, that, that, that people don't want to go back. However, what we also have to think about is the, the, the rising numbers and also the impact it's having on the NHS. And, of course, the impact it's having on the NHS um, is not just about the impact that COVID-19 is having, but it's on all of the other services too. But if the NHS had gone into the pandemic in a better state and much more fight and fit, then we would have been able to deal with this in a far better way, um, which I... And I think think that that is a real concern but there's also another group of people who I think um, we, we do need to think carefully and seriously about and that's about people um, a lot many of whom are disabled people and people who were shielding in the initial um, parts of the pandemic mm -hmm. they are really terrified about going out and about and and I heard um, Craig say that that we have to you know avoid avoid people who are vulnerable and and who, who might have been shielding and I take that point but also we can't expect these people to live in isolation no, for the rest point. of their that's lives and point. and so I think we all have a responsibility to, to do the right thing here and there's some excellent work being done by a woman called Dr Sally Witcher actually who's, who's recently published some information and, and um, a, a writing on the importance of getting it right for people who were shielding and looking at things like you know why can't we have access to Evisheld for example in Scotland why can't we have the you booster You might need program? to explain to, uh, for other people so, who are not sure what that so is. So Evisheld is, is one, of the, um, one of the drugs that can support someone if they're immunocompromised and that is not a drug that's easily readily available in Scotland and it's something that 
it should be, because as part of a, of, of a society that is hoping to get back to normal, we can't just leave some people out. Nobody, the, in the last two years, we were all excluded. None of us could go and see our family and friends. We were all stuck inside. We couldn't do what we normally do. We couldn't access public transport or jobs or, um, or, or go out and see our family and friends like we used to do. But so many people, and particularly disabled people, have lived lives of that kind of exclusion for years. And if it's not good enough for all of us, and it isn't because it was horrible, it shouldn't be good enough for any of us. And we need to think carefully about what we do next. Man there in the blue jacket. Now that we've been so far removed from restrictions, is there not a risk that, say they were brought back in, that there's going to be a low level of compliance anyway? Yeah. I, uh, because of fatigue, we just don't want to... Yeah. We've been locked up then. for years, then why would people choose to go back after yeah. having been vaccinated and stuff as well? Yeah. OK, let me take another point and then I'll come to you, Susie. Yes, the woman there. Yes, um, I would also like to point out that um, perhaps people following the restrictions will be less likely this time around because yeah. who would listen to the government after they've broken their own rules? <laughs> Both my parents uh, were in the shielding group. My mum is immunosuppressed. Uh, I obviously, my whole life just went. It just went overnight and I couldn't particularly work for the best part of two years. If someone came out and told me, look, you need to wear face masks again, I would, I would have no problem. I think there is a social and moral responsibility, but everyone has to do their own choice. But like that member of the audience just said, it is very difficult to try and persuade everyone to do that when there's been ABBA parties and karaoke machines. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's where the difficulty is going to lie yep. in, in trying, because if some of us do it, great, but it, it's a collective effort. And unfortunately, that didn't come from the heart of the UK government, and now we're in the situation. <laughs> In Scotland, we kept face masks longer than England, and it had no effect at all. We'd worse cases than England. So why would we bring them back in? So, so if, if they were, I mean, because as I say, COVID cases are rising, but you wouldn't want to go back to face masks and social distancing. We kept, them, we kept face masks for a good bit longer than England did. And we had worse cases than we had in England when they weren't, didn't have to face masks on. Yeah. So I don't I see why, that's why a we'd very want good to point, go back to You've it. got to ask just what difference does it make? And right at the start of COVID last time, nobody really knew. Nobody knew how serious it would be. Nobody knew well, whether lockdown was effective or not, whether people would have locked themselves down without sending the police after us, which now looks to have been the case. But also with face masks now, there's not so much evidence from all around the world. You can look around and see what countries use what policies. Did face masks make a meaningful difference? And also COVID cases themselves, that you, 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 I think it's a bit of a mistake just to look at the cases. Because a lot of people now, you've been vaccinated, maybe been exposed to it before. It's just not as much a threat as it was to catch COVID, as it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So, I mean, hospital hospitalisations are rising. Yes, exactly. But if that's the best thing to keep a look on. How hospitalisations and people in ICUs, if hospitals look in any danger of being um, overburdened in this way, then that's when you start to take restrictions. But now, I think we, last time we had to guess over what would work and what didn't. Now we've got a world, literally a world of evidence to look at. So I think the simple thing to do is to follow the scientific advice. And this time, I think, the scientific advice will be a lot more accurate because we've got a lot more to go on. Woman there in the white top. We keep talking about the problems with the NHS. However, one of the things that we're forgetting is that staff are absolutely yep. burnt out. Yeah. We are working <laughs> our So you, you work done. in the NHS, do you? Yes. We do. There's a few of us here. So we have worked our socks off. I personally worked throughout the entire time. And I worked long, long, long shifts. And I worked with masks on. We worked in really quite challenging situations. And that's something that we're, forget we're forgetting the impact this is having. And that's having an impact on how we provide our services. Mm -hmm. It's also having an impact on how, and I'll only speak about nursing staff because we are nurses, how we deliver our services. Mm -hmm. And so we need to stop and step back and think about that because if we want NHS and our healthcare to be the standard that it yep. was, the gold standard that we want to attain, we need to protect our staff. And if that means we wear masks, so be it. If that means we do limited lockdowns, so be it, because we want our healthcare to be the best it can possibly be. How long is the government going to take before they realise that perhaps cross-party collaboration uh, to, say, give money to the NHS 
mm. rather than using it as a shuttlecock to create an effect one way or another. It's always their fault, their fault, their fault. It's always somebody's fault. Why not have a cross-party agreement to pay for the NHS? So uh, I'm quite personally affected with this. Both of my elderly uh, parents have spent much of the last three years in and out of hospital. My father died last uh, month um, in part oh, because of COVID. And so I have nothing but admiration for you and your colleagues um, here in the rest of the country. But what that has, has shown me, that experience has shown me, is that COVID hasn't gone away. And it is still here. And it seems to me, and I was listening to much of what Fraser was saying and disagreeing with what he, what he was saying, and then I agreed with him, which was we must follow the scientific advice. I, I'm not an expert in this, nor is Fraser, nor the rest of us on, on this panel. We are very fortunate that we have had great scientific advisors. And I think um, because we know that, uh, unfortunately, COVID is still with us and it is likely to come back, we need to keep the vaccinations up. What we do need to do is we need to listen to the, the, the scientific advice. If there may be difficulties with compliance, we are going to have to confront that. But it seems to me we, we can't pretend it's gone away. It's still with us. It's still having the impact on the health service and everybody who works in it. Uh, and we're going to have to do everything that we can to support. And yes, record numbers um, of staff and record number of funding in the NHS in, in Scotland and more is required. But I think this, we, we can't hope against hope that it's gone away. It hasn't. It's still with us. But in terms of restrictions, which is what the question is about, the National Clinical Director, Jason Leach, said he thought more restrictions were unlikely. So, well, he also said that he thought that it was worthwhile, um, in, in, in contrast to one of the questioners, he thought that it was worthwhile in certain circumstances wearing a mask. And I'm some, I, take a, I take the bus in Edinburgh to, uh, to work every morning. And last week, after he made the, these points publicly, I did notice that there was a greater number of people, and I was wearing a mask again. He, that was he, what he thought was the right thing to do, so I followed that advice. I, I think we need to listen to the experts, and if they are going to advise us that we need to go back to nobody wants to go back to restrictions i think we're agreed on that but if we if we need to we will have to but we have to follow the advice rather than having an, a, a, a less than in fully informed a discussion as people who are not the the practitioners and the people who work in the nhs as well we appreciate that you appreciate us and we appreciated our applause throughout that time however that didn't put bread on our table mm -hmm. it didn't sustain us through 12 14 hour yeah. shifts yeah. it didn't keep us going what what's going to change about that Existing and that's right. something that we really need to be that needs to be considered yeah. i'm not hearing any answers yeah, to that okay. let's hear from the, the woman at the back then yeah i a few questions first of all boris definitely had millions of pounds on the side of a bus at brexit to solve that lady's problem so where's that because that didn't happen where is the testing facilities for COVID? Can people still get free tests? So where are the numbers coming from? How bad is the problem? And I've been in hospital. There's not enough of them. We're taking our nurses and single-handedly destroying them one at a time with not enough staff to do what they're trained to do. For most of them, it's a vocation and having political debate about how we can make things better. You make it better by paying them and you make it better by testing. OK, well, look, to your latter point, let me go to another question. From Craig Levy. Craig, where are you? Right. Uh, with Police Scotland joining the RMT with industrial unrest and trouble on the horizon from nurses and teachers, is strike action about to spread to the whole public sector and how should government act now to prevent this? Right, and I've moved to that simply because we're talking about funding nurses and, of course, there is talk of a strike action. Can I just ask you, do you, you, do you support that? I do. I never have supported strike action, particularly within healthcare, but... Now that I am at this stage in my career, I am scunnered with getting underpaid. I, I don't take enough money home at the end of the month to pay all my bills. And I, I technically am a professional. Mm. So why is that? That is totally ignored. Also the fact that our working circumstances, our working environment are appalling. I personally work within mental health and I actually work in drug and alcohol recovery at this moment. We are so woefully underfunded. You can't even express... I'm actually almost speechless trying to express how woefully underfunded we are. We run ourselves ragged. We have a team of eight covering a vast geographical area, and we are stuck. We are st our hands are tied. I hear we were talking about sort of resources, testing centres and all the rest of it in terms of drugs and alcohol recovery. That's brilliant in the cities. 
What about the remote and rural areas? Yeah. What do, what, what's okay. out there for there? OK. So the question is, is strike action, which is being threatened by the nurses, is strike action about to spread to the public sector as a whole? We've got Police Scotland who are not striking because they can't, but they are working to rule. What should the government do about it? That's the question, Fraser. Well, right now, the government's in, uh, both the Scottish government sorting out things up here and the UK government isn't a problem because you've got, when inflation's running about 10%, unless you're getting a 10% pay rise, I mean, that's a real terms pay cut. Now, right now, you've got, in the private sector, pay rises of about, averaging about 8% right now. In the public sector, it's close to 2%. Now, that is the gap, which is a recipe for strikes because people are going to look at what you know, private sector settlements are saying and then asking the government. The government is in enough financial trouble as it is in both sides of the border. So very difficult decisions, and I don't envy them, people like Angus. And, but the, one of the things, I mean, in every... Sure, you can lump them together, but they're really quite different. Um, I mean, the RMT, for example, their strikes are evolved things like, you know, they, they, they're, they're saying one of the things that rail track want to do is to put sensors on the tracks rather than have pupil, sorry, humans um, doing pretty dangerous work. The RMT is against that. They're arguing over things like that. With Police Scotland, it's more just straightforward paying conditions. And you've got to look at as well of the last sort of four to five years pay and take that into consideration. Now, this is the inflation nightmare, of course, and of, what, you know, what the government should have done is not let inflation go down to so control as it has done, because once you've got inflation at this rate, then everybody's going to be out of pocket. It's a recipe for a summer of strikes, um, and right now, it's quite simple. The government doesn't have any answers. It's run out of cash. It can't it hardly tax us anymore, because taxes are something like a 75-year high. Um, but this, this sort of mismanagement of the economy and the crisis of the last sort of two, three years has really let the inflationary cat out of the bag. So I'm glad I'm not a politician right now because I can't think of any good answers. Can, so, so, so let me get around the panel and I will come back to you. Can you think of any good answers, Angus? Well, I think, well, firstly, I've acknowledged the seriousness of the situation. And I think there's much to commend what Fraser was just saying in terms of the challenge, both for the Scottish government and the UK government and governments around the world that are also having to deal with inflation rates as, as they currently are. I think one thing is absolutely key to trying to find a way through this is to, as best as possible, to have a constructive relationship with different public sector workers. Uh, what we have seen, unfortunately, down south, with government ministers going on television and literally demonising the representatives of people in, in, in rail unions, for example, that's absolutely no way to solve these issues. We need to find a way as best as we can. And in Scotland, we recently saw um, an end to uh, a potentially escalating dispute in, in our railways here, and a solution was found, and now we're hearing uh, rail representatives in England saying that they would wish that the UK government was doing the same as the Scottish government. It's not simple, but we yeah, have to work our way... We have, well, uh, well, there was disruption, and, but unlike the UK government, we did not take a confrontational approach to the representatives of public sector workers. In that way, all, all that is going to happen is that we are going to head into a summer, summer strikes, and that is to nobody's benefit. I'm in favour of trying to sit down constructively, find a solution, find the pay settlements that people deserve. It's, it's not going to be easy, but that's surely the only way forward. Woman there in the red and white dress, yes. The public sector, primarily health and social care, are the ones who have been keeping this country going the past yes. two and a half years. And yes. what thanks have we got? A, a real terms 10% pay cut and a lost invite to Boris's parties. <laughs> in the white shirt and blue jacket. The police officers have been recently offered £565 per officer as a pay rise, which equates to approximately 0.8% to 2% through the ranks. Police officers throughout the COVID issue, or the pandemic, were at the front line of dealing with people's mental health, attending calls with parties, yeah. um, neighbour versus neighbour, and to be offered that kind of pay rise mm -hmm. is an absolute disgrace. And no wonder they're now going to be demoralised and working to rule. It, it, yeah. I'm going to come back to you on that, Angus. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I want to I want to pick up on a few on a few points we've heard about this. And the first thing I want to say is that the the way that NHS staff and police officers during during the pandemic were on the front line and we were clapping um, every night at eight o'clock, we were all out clapping and, and banging pans or whatever else we were doing to thank them for what they did. But the woman who said this earlier on was absolutely bang on. That doesn't put food on the table, and that's why it's Im absolutely imperative for both governments to start making sure that we value workers. And so here in Scotland, would you would you give the Scottish nurses a 10% pay rise? 
we have, we need to look at the conditions that that woman is. No, no, sure. I, I'm, I'm not disputing. I'm just asking. Would would, the, would, would the, Labour do the that? Trade of, of Labour absolutely absolutely would be on the side of the workers on this, and we have been saying so. Jackie Bailey has been making consistent demands of the Scottish government to not only pay people better, but to end delayed discharge, because delayed discharge only means that nurses in the health service are ending up having to be rushed off their feet, and people are not able to get out of hospital when they need to. So we need to pay people properly. We need to sort the terms and conditions in which they're working. Like, I, I attended hospitals, as many of us did, all through the pandemic. These people literally knocked their pan in the whole pandemic and hardly got a been in response. And the person who just spoke just now about the way that they were treated, when we look at the pay offer by police, uh, for police and for social care staff, 48 pence an hour increase for social care staff. Are you kidding me on? That is absolutely derisory. And it's that kind of, that kind of offer that will mean we will not attract people into, into those, those um, occupations and will not keep people in them either. And we absolutely need to, because they're the best of our country. Excuse me. Obviously, the money has to be found. Yeah, the money has to be found, but isn't it amazing how in 2008 we found all the money to bail out banks? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Found the money to bail out banks. Shareholders and energy companies are absolutely raking it in. People are struggling to heat and eat, and we turn our back on the people who are the infrastructure of your country. That is what is so morally irreprehensible about all of this in this country. So what do you think the Scottish Government should do? I think they should try and find the money. Listen, and uh, do you know what? If it involves taxation, whatever mechanisms or whatever levers of power, they have to do that. They have to try and find the money. And I'm not just... I know we're in Scotland and we're quite Scottish-centric tonight. That, that goes for the whole UK. That, these people, your police, your railways... Your railways aren't just about shuttling someone about the country. It's also your food. Mm -hmm. It's free. This is the infrastructure of our country we are talking about. This is our nurses, our police, our fire service, our railway workers. It is a shambles, okay. an absolute shambles. Great. <laughs> would you would you pay the nurse? Sorry, what's your name? What's your name? Ailey. Ailey. Would you pay Ailey ten percent more? Well, I'm, I'm not. I'm not in government, so it wouldn't. It wouldn't be an issue for me. But let me say this. No, but were you? Workers, should you be so fortunate as to be in government? Would you? Exactly. Would you? I think. I think. Money? Well, not not in Scotland. No, we're not. But right, but look, right, look, right. look I, I hugely right. value uh, the work that public. No, we, everyone can say that. Would now, you give them the money? Is, um, me personally, ten percent and more. Whether or not that's affordable, I don't know. And I think one one of the issues we have to be mindful of here is that the public services in Scotland are completely and utterly on their knees. And I spoke to a nurse recently who said, actually, I'd like to be able to take a holiday in addition to getting a pay rise. I'd like to be able to work uh, my, my, you know, my hours rather than having to do extra shifts. I'd like to be able to get home to see my kids before the end of the day. So I reckon it's not, recognise it's not all about money, but the most important thing here is that across the public sector, we recognise the huge efforts that people put in during the COVID pandemic and come to a fair and proportionate uh, pay settlement. That will be different in different sectors. But one thing is for sure, with inflation running at 9%, we cannot be paying public sector workers 2 or 3% pay increases. It's simply not sustainable. But we also need to remember that a, that a, a, a large um, uh, increase in public sector wages is only paid by one of two things. It's either cuts to frontline services or tax rises, and, and they will feed through the system. So it's a very, very difficult balancing okay. act for ministers, both in well, Scotland and the UK. Let's ask, but I'm since, absolutely with saying we need to reward public sector. Since you are in government, since, you are, since, since the SNP are in government, would you be paying Ailey 10% as requested? In order, A, because that's what she wants, and B, to avoid a strike. Yeah. So I, I wish everybody who's involved in the pay negotiations at the present time every you're success. You're offering 2%, in, just so... So the, the, okay. issue, the issue is being is currently under discussion, and I was highlighting, I was highlighting the, the fact that where a will could be found to find a solution in the rail dispute, for example, because it had got to that stage earlier than it has within the health service, a resolution could be found. I don't have the answers to all of this. I know that there's a willingness to try and get to the fair level of remuneration, given that everybody is facing effectively, as, as was pointed out before, because of inflation, we're all facing effectively having less money. We're on a, you know, we're, we're on a position where all of us are going backwards. The challenge, though, for government is unless you're able to grow the budget to be able to satisfy the demand and the worthy pay claims that there are, there is not a, a money, money tree to be able to do that. And secondly, we're hampered in Scotland that we don't have the ability to borrow. 
So what normal governments do in times of extremis, if one requires the resources, and this is the point that Susie was making about bailouts and banks and so on, is when you're in a really extreme situation, you need the resources, you need to have all of the levers of power to be able to do that. We currently don't have that, so we're constrained. Yeah. But that does not mean we do not have the, the, we do not have the wish and the willingness to try and support fair pay resolution, especially in the public services, for all the reasons that members of the audience but Angus, highlighted. But Angus, but Angus, look, um, the SNP in Scotland have cut local council budgets in real terms for a decade, and now they're walking away and saying it's, an, uh, it's between COSLA and councils. One of the reasons that councils cannot meet the pay uh, uh, requirements and the pay requests is because the SNP have cut their budgets for year after year after year. Craig, They've the hollowed out Scotland's councils. Where's the, where's, the, where's, the, where's the money coming from? Is it coming Angus, from the UK government? Angus has, a record, there... Angus has a record settlement of £41 billion this year uh, through the Barnet consequentials. That's more than the history of devolution. And if he and the SNP had properly run the public finances in Scotland, we would be able to meet more of those Wishful pay requests. Right. Let, let me hear a bit more from the audience. There's a woman there with the, the blue scarf and the White top, yes. Wouldn't it be fiscal suicide to put wages up? The more you put, if you put wages up, it's going to push inflation up, the cost of living is going to get even higher, and then the, the growth the growth is going to be, be even slower than it is. You know, it, it, it'll just stop. Okay. The woman here in the green and white stripy top. Uh, well, just get a microphone to you, sorry. Is there not a danger if you give a sector, a 10% pay rise. I don't know what a nurse's salary is, but 10% oh, no. of 20,000 yeah. is certainly a lot less than 10% of a surgeon's yeah. salary at 100,000. Yeah. It should be a sliding <laughs> scale <laughs> to make sure everybody gets a better... Maybe we should reduce yeah. politicians' salaries. <laughs> <laughs> You three up for that? It, it, actually, you, you've raised a really good point, Susie, and Angus made the point earlier on that we're all struggling and everybody's... But actually, we're not all struggling equally. Let's be honest with ourselves. There's no way people... Like, I know there are people struggling a heck of a lot more than most of us on this panel are right now. And that's because people on low incomes and people who are living in poverty are experiencing higher inflation because that's how it works, and, and we know that that because the Scottish Fiscal Commission have told us and others have told us. And so we know that people who are on low wages and living in poverty are struggling much, much more more than the rest of us, and that's why we need to change the way the economy works. Okay. Raise taxes on the, on the wealthy. Sorry, let's just get a microphone to you, and then I want to come to you. What are you saying? Ra raise taxes on the wealthy. If you're saying what, what you seem to be saying is we need a redistribution of wealth, the way to do that is through a taxation system. Why are we not doing that? So raising ta raise taxes, you're saying? Raise taxes for the okay. wealthy. What about the man here in the front? I am getting a bit aggravated with this conversation. The truth well, is, I'm sorry well, about no, that. it's but yes. Well, you, you have been partially responsible for okay. it. Okay. In Scotland, we produce enough power with our power stations, our hydro plants, to provide enough power for us. We are exporting the power to the national grid for pennies, but it's bloody well coming. Sorry, I, I rephrase that. But it's coming back from 10 pence to 35 pence, and the government is doing nothing to stop this. What I want to know is, why are we exporting it out first and not giving it to ourselves first? That's the first question. Your power bills should be at 15 pence a, a kilowatt, not 35 going to 50 or 60. Well, I, th I think we there's a whole question about buying, buying energy on the international markets, but I, I hear your point, sir. I, I hear what you say. Would you like to ask the man here? So I, th I think we've, there, there's a genuine question about why is Scotland such an energy-rich country, but we don't have the full benefit of the energy that we produce. There's a, there's a massive issue in all of that. Um, and what, what is absolutely perverse, and I'd encourage everybody in the audience to go out and have a look at this, have a look at the national transmission charges there are from Scotland to the rest of the UK, i.e. not just that we produce as much electricity as we do in other forms of energy, but we have to pay an additional price for the benefit of having produced it. It's okay. absolutely topsy-turvy. It's a totally wrong way uh, round. And it's definitely something sh that should be sorted, okay. sir. But I would gently point out to you that most of the major decision-making powers that relate to this do not rest mm -hmm. in the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government. It rests at Westminster, something we could change after a referendum, and we vote hopefully... Oh, so there we are. Back, there we back are. To, back to
Yeah. We were talking about strikes and we've come full circle back to our first question. OK, I have to end it here. Our hour is up. Thank you very much to the panel for coming along this evening. Thank you very much to our audience here at Inverness. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching from Question Time in Inverness. Good night.